Somewhere recently, that wanting to go back to normal was a mental disorder, and um, I think the uh, the fact is, we are normal, and we're going to stay normal. Hallelujah! All right. Well, we're glad to have you. Thank you for joining us, and um, trust that you will be blessed as we jump in here tonight. We're continuing to teach on soteriology, and uh, we've already talked about um, on this part of uh, applying uh, redemption or you know uh, salvation to our lives uh, we talked about faith and um talked about um well talked about the other thing the other week I've, <laughs> i forgot what it was i don't have those notes I've, I've got the next set of notes hallelujah so we're um we're uh we're talking <laughs> what was it? it was um faith come on somebody help me out here the one before that looking to my support here all right, I'll think of it in a minute. Hallelujah. But we're moving on to justification tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're, we're moving on to justification. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, justification by faith uh, is the foundation truth of God's provision for salvation uh, for guilty and lost sinners. Okay. Now it was... Um, it was the great truth which the Protestant Reformation restored to the Christian church. Remember when Martin Luther um, was crawling on his knees in the abbey and bleeding and the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And he wrote his 99 theses, nailed it to the door of the church and um, was booted as a heretic. But it was the restoration of justification by faith that uh, brought the church back into its proper relationship with God. Hallelujah. Um, it's frequently referred to in scriptures, yet it is one of the most neglected and misunderstood doctrines at all, in all evangelical theology. It is such a far-reaching, and it has a, such a far-reaching nature, that uh, many seem to be afraid, be afraid to teach and to believe scriptural declarations concerning it. Yet we must understand, uh, it must be understood if we are to grasp and fully understand the great salvation, according to Hebrews 2.3, that God has gloriously and freely provided. There's a lot of stuff when we come to start talking about that we've been, we've been justified that people draw back from because it, it just messes with their head. And I'm going to tell you, your head's got to be messed with. <laughs> it's just the way it is. When it comes to the Bible, your head needs to get messed with and get straightened out. Now, regeneration and justification are, are um, very closely related doctrines. Regeneration has to do with what takes place in the believer's heart. Um, justification is, is his, um, the believer's standing before God. Okay? So they're, they're occurring, and they are similar doctrines, but one is the, the work in the heart. The other is the standing before God. Hallelujah. Um, re regeneration refers to the impartation of life into the believer. Justification to his being declared righteous in the eyes of God. Regeneration is the, is the divine answer to the spiritual problem. Justification is the divine answer to the problem of guilt. Hallelujah. Now, it is a legal term. Justification is, is a judicial legal term, um, wh which pictures that the sinner before the bar of God to receive condemnation for the sins he has committed. When he stands before God, he stands guilty. When you come to God as a, as a sinner, when you come to God as a <clears throat> lost, and you come to him, <coughs> you stand guilty. <clears throat> However, instead of being condemned, you are judicially pronounced as not guilty, being declared by God to be righteous. How did that take place? By faith in the redemptive work of Christ. Hallelujah. Because the work the, because you've received by faith um, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been born again. Um, you're now able to stand before God not guilty. Uh, one person kind of did a little word play on the word justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So and that's really true. And that's one of the things that 
that people have such a hard time with when they come to God. I'm just no sinner saved by grace. And they want to rehash all the stuff they ever did before they came to God because they're grateful to God that he's forgiven them, but they still are carrying the guilt of it. Remember the book of Hebrews um, states that says that the blood of bulls and goats, the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more? <clears throat> how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God hallelujah from dead works to your conscience gets purged that means the guilt is removed hallelujah um it has been declared as the act of God whereby he declares righteous him who believes on God. It is not that the sinner is righteous, hallelujah, but that he is declared righteous based on the basis of his faith in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that, that standing shifts from a sinner to declared righteous, and now you become the righteousness of God in that declaration of just through justification. <clears throat> Second Corinthians five twenty one, uh, he who knew no sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! Can we get me a stool? Um, hallelujah! Glory to God. And so that we could be declared righteous and stand before God free from guilt and free from sin. Abraham believed God under the Old Testament. They were accounted as righteousness, but it was an accounting um, for future impart, complete future impartation when uh, Jesus had finished his work. Glory to God. Just one second. I'm going to um, hope I don't drop too far out of the picture. Glory to God. We'll, uh, we'll make it work, guys. Hallelujah. A to the men. Glory to God. All right. So, um, now Romans 4 3, Abraham was believed God was accounted to him for righteousness. Justification is not just forgiveness of sin or the pardon of sin, it is the removal of the guilt and condemnation. It is the removal of the guilt and condemnation. It is the putting away of sin. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's, so the negative side is, it's the putting away of sin. The, the, the positive side is, the reckoning of or to put into one's account or declaring them righteous. <clears throat> but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness. For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Praise God. And that's, that was 1 first, uh, first Corinthians one thirty and 2 Corinthians 5.21. Justification includes the sinner's deliverance from wrath and also his acceptance as righteous in the sight and presence of God. When God justified the sinner, God place him, places him in the position as a righteous man. It is though he had never sinned. Glory to God. It is though he had never sinned. Praise God. Hallelujah. When God justifies the sinner who trusts in the saving grace of Jesus Christ, all evidence, hallelujah, and guilt is completely wiped out. Look at Jeremiah 50 and 20. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. And there shall be none in the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. For I will pardon them whom I reserve. What a declaration. For certainly Israel and Judah have done some doozies in their past. Hallelujah. Just like you. Just like me. But through the work of God, through the justifying work of God, that is wiped out. I am the Lord I, uh, I remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. Hallelujah. 
Um, I will remember them no more. Glory to God. Judah had plenty of sin. Israel and Judah had plenty of sins of which they're guilty. But when for God, God forgives, he forgets. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put their laws in, my, in their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Hebrews 10, 16, and 17. Just that, just that alone is amazing. For he is the omniscient, all-knowing God, and he knows all things. The only thing we're ever told that God forgets is the sins of the one who trusts in his great salvation. Thus does not, God does not say, see believers as forgiven sinners. God does not see believers as forgiven sinners. Say that right there where you are. God does not see believers as forgiven sinners. He sees them rather as those who had never sinned. That, my friend, is one of the things we're talking about when we say evangelical theology doesn't, they just, they, they choke. A lot of people will choke on that. And we'll hear people testify, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Even got songs, Southern Gospel Quartet songs. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. You know, well, I was an old sinner. Well, actually, I was a young sinner. <laughs> I got saved by grace, and now I've been justified. And my father does not remember the sin. My father does not remember the iniquity. My father only sees me as righteous. Now, if my father only sees me as righteous, why should I see myself some other way? Because somebody with, you know, a Ph.D. or you know, letters behind their name or somebody who's moved by their feelings has decided that, well, it just can't be that good. Well, it is that good. I said it is that good because the blood of Jesus is more powerful than sin. Blood of Je the blood of Jesus is more powerful than the taint of sin. As we quoted from you earlier from Hebrews, where it says that the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of the heifer sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So the believer's sins are all forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm sorry. I would jump ahead there. The God does not see you. Say, say it again one more time. This is so important. If you've been walking around and you've been brought up, say, I'm just no sinner saved by grace. Stop it. Go to the mirror and slap yourself. Grab yourself by the collar and go pow. And say, stop saying that. Because God no longer sees you as a sinner who was saved by grace. He sees you as the righteousness of God. God in Christ Jesus, covered by the blood, washed in the blood. Your garments, you've laid our righteousness. You know, yeah, go quote Romans 3 and then but read the rest of it. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. It is. But I'm not talking about mine. I've received the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. I laid my garments of righteousness down. I picked up his garments of righteousness, praise God, and they are perfect and blem without blemish, without spot, and I stand that way before God, and so do you. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Believer's sins are all forgiven. It follows that the guilt and punishment of those sins is also removed, and I keep wanting to run down there and jump down there. God does not see the believer as forgiven sinners. He sees them rather as those who've never sinned. What is involved in justification? Number one, pardon or remission. Pardon or remission. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren. Um, I might even want to dis, um, in, introduce another word uh, beyond pardon and remission. And um, it, was, it came to me, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm getting ready to use the wrong word. But when you go, they, they take your, your record if you're a juvenile or whatever, is that you exonerate? What is the, the, the term when you, 
expunged. It's wiped out. There you go. Expunged. Thank you. That was where I was looking for it. I knew exonerate wasn't in. I was trying to, trying to get there. Expunged. What happens when a, a criminal record is expunged? It doesn't exist. It's like it was never done. So you don't have to report as a felon. You don't have to, you know, so if you were a felon, you committed a felony, but your record gets expunged. You don't have to, any of the things that, that, that are, rec, that are uh, in relation to having a felony record, you don't have to do because your record was expunged. They can't go look you up in the database and find you with a criminal record. It's gone. Hallelujah. And so pardon, remission, or, or the expunging of sins, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. <laughs> And by all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, remember, the key word in the Old Testament in relationship to, to dealing with sin is atonement. It's used one time in the New Testament, and it is, tr quite frankly, I'll say bad translation. Really, it's a mistranslation. It's a bad translation for the word that's where it's used. It is not a New Testament the, uh, doctrine. It is not a New Testament theology. The word is not even the word for atonement that it translates. But the, the uh, King Jimmy translators used it because that was so ingrained in their thinking as they were translating from the Old Testament. Atonement meant to cover. Atonement meant to cover. It was still there. It was just covered. Under the New Testament, remission, to remove, to wipe away, to go away. It's not there. Hallelujah. Are you here? So um, we couldn't be justified by the law of Moses. We could not be. Now, Mo the Bible says that Moses' faith was reckoned to him for righteousness. In other words, he had a standing reckoning of righteousness. But now we come into the new. We are declared righteous. We've been declared the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Our sin has been sponged. It's wiped away. It's removed. It's no longer there. Glory to God. Hallelujah. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, Ephesians 1, 7. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, <coughs> hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, because the believer's sins are all forgiven, it follows, if they're forgiven, that all guilt and punishment of those, of those sins are also removed. Now, we've been quoting 2 Corinthians 5, 21, okay? Um, but it says, the Word of God says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. One translation actually says a new, cre new species of being that didn't exist before. We're born again. We are not, listen, we are not believing sinners. We are born again believers. It's a big difference. I'm not a caterpillar anymore. There's nothing about me you can, make, you can find that makes me like a caterpillar. I've become a butterfly. I'm not, a bull, I'm not a tadpole anymore. Nothing about I'm a bullfrog. Bull, remember, we all, bull, bullfrogs and butterflies. Both been born again. I know it's metamorphosis. Um, but the fact is, we are different. We're not the same. We're not believing sinners. That we believe on Christ, but we're still the sinner. And we're still walking in our sin that's just been covered up for a later date. No, it's been removed. It's been remitted. It's been washed. It's been sponged. I'm a new creature in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. And verse 18 starts out and says this, and all things are of God. John, uh, the, the uh, beloved apostle John got so excited about that. He said, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Not going to be. Not, not in the sweet by and by. Not when I cross over on the other side. 
Not one of these days where the circle won't be broken. Oh, I'm going to be a child of God. No, you're one right now. Glory to God. Hallelujah. One right now, this very moment, you're a child of God. Can you shout hallelujah out there? If you're at home, just shout hallelujah. If your spouse or somebody around you is looking at you like you're crazy, say you ought to be watching Pastor Ed right now. You be shouting too. Hallelujah. Praise God. Through, uh, so we're, they're pardoned. The believer's sins are all pardoned. It follows that all guilt and punishment of the sins is also removed. Restoration. Okay, so we're pardoned. Now we're restored to God's favor. Hallelujah. Woo. Amen. The sinner who has been born again has not merely, and, we, and maybe we should change this from this. Yeah. We're trying to show you there's a, there's a progress here from the sinner becoming, okay, this is salvation. We're, we're moving from one state to another. But now that you've been born again, you have not merely incurred, um, the sinner, is, I'm sorry, the sinner outside of God has not merely incurred a penalty, but has also lost, lost God's favor and is subject to his wrath. He that believeth not the Son of God hath not seen life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3, 36. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Romans 1, 18. Through justification, all of that is changed. Much more then. Now, I mean, being now, everybody say now. Give me some hand clap nows out there. Hallelujah. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 5, 9. I didn't see any hand claps go out there. Come on, bring me your hand claps. Let me read it one more time. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, not going to be justified. We are now justified. Hallelujah. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Hallelujah. One of the great problems in society today has to do with the rehabilitation of those uh, who serve time for a com crime committed. Even though you may have paid a debt to society, it's difficult for such a person to find a place in the community again. You're marked as a criminal and not easily received by those who knew you before. That's why a large purport, uh, proportion of those who've been incarcerated drift back into the company of old criminal element and are very often arrested and sentenced to another period in prison. But thank God his grace is so abundant and we have received into his favor as though we had never broken his law. As though we had never broken his law. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Titus 3 Verses four through seven. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Now, remember, ours were as filthy rags. But we took up Jesus's. But according to the, his mercy, he saved us by the washing of gene, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This restoration to favor is illustrated for us in the parable of the prodigal son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and his shoes on his feet, bring hither the fatted calf, hallelujah, and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. This restoration um, is confirmed by P.P. Uh, P. Fitzwater. From these texts, it is seen that justification is more than a restoration. I mean, a, a, a um, remission of sin and acquittal. The justified man is more than a discharged criminal. He is restored to the position of one who is righteous. God treats him as though he never sinned. God treats him as though he never sinned. Let me say it one more time. Because people go around like a bunch of bozos going, I'm just no sinner saved by grace. God treats you as though you never sinned. The imputation of 
the Christ's righteousness. Now, Ephesians states it this way. The sinner must not only be pardoned for his past sins, but also supplied with a positive righteousness before he can have fellowship with God. This need is supplied in the imputation of the righteousness of Christ to the believer. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord imputed righteousness without works, uh, saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's Romans 4, 6 through 8. Uh, James Buchanan, uh, a divinity professor at uh, New College in Ed Edinburgh, or, or was, hallelujah, in, uh, in, 19, in 1867, so he's not around anymore. 1867, he published, um, uh, and in one of his writings, he said this, Indeed, justification consists partly in the non-imputation of sins, which he did, which did personally belong to the, a sinner, and partly in the imputation of righteousness, of which he was utterly destitute of, and the meaning of the one may be ascertained from the meaning of the other, while both are necessary to express the full meaning of justification. God no longer imputes sin to you. He imputes righteousness to you. So stop saying, I'm an old sinner saved by grace. It's a terrible confession. And then, well, I want to be humble. Then, then if you're humble, you'll accept what God did, says. It's final authority. Hallelujah. All fellowship with the Holy God must be based on the, or must be, um, must take place on the grounds or basis of righteousness. <clears throat> Paul writes in the first two and a half chapters of a book to the church at Rome, he deals with every classification of society and shows that they have no righteousness of their own. He sums up that with these words. Now we know that what things, whoever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by law is the knowledge of sin. The law was given to show you that you are sinful. Not for a way to get out of it, but to show you you were sinful. It's a hopeless picture indeed. This is not, but this is not the end of the story. The law brings you to the state that I'm lost without hope, without God in this world, and then offers the solution. Glory to God. But now, but now, everybody say, but now. Thank God for a but and a now. <coughs> Amen. The now buts. Praise God. The righteousness of God without the law is the righteousness of God, which is by God imputes to the believer the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I am covered over with the blood of Jesus. Amen. I'm covered over with the cloak of righteousness. How often have we heard Romans 116? I am not ashamed. 116. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. You people don't want to stop there. But the testimony you just stop. Say, why is the gospel of the power of um, why is the gospel the power of God in salvation? Because verse 17 goes on and says, For therein, for therein, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for there, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth. 
for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Christ's righteousness is provided through the gospel for all those who will believe in him. Hallelujah. <clears throat> a pardoned criminal is never described as a good or righteous man. When God justifies the sinner, he declares him righteous in his own sight. Listen to this, Romans 8, 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. The only one that had the right to do it is God, and he don't remember it anymore. Hallelujah. But thank God he justifies the ungodly. The righteousness which the sinner receives to his account is nothing less than the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus is in uh, to, uh, it's imputed to him means to put it so it becomes listen the um, the word impute means to put to the account of justification does not impart Christ's righteousness to the sinner um, inf nor infuse him with it so that he becomes part of his inner nature um, that is the result of the new birth and when you when God imputes it to you you receive it and then you become it hallelujah when God when God declares it, when you receive it, it then becomes part of who you are. Glory to God. <clears throat> um, this righteousness being the merit of work and a mere quality of uh, this righteousness, the righteousness uh, being a mere quality of character may become ours by being imputed to us. Hallelujah. And it's, in, it's infused into us and um, it belongs to us through the redemptive work of Christ. Hallelujah. How can God do it? How can a holy and righteous God who cannot countenance sin declare righteous one who's born in sin and thus is guilty of both the sin and the nature and the practice of sin? Um, well, that's next. That's a good question. Let's look into um, that. Well, we, yeah, we got time to get through some of this tonight. I will say part of it anyway. How does it happen? How does this happen? It happens through the act. Hallelujah. The method of justification. It's very important that we understand the method by which God justifies the sinner. It is the very basis of our standing before God. Hallelujah. It is not something we can simply be taking for granted. God cannot merely overlook sin out of the bigness of his heart. He has to preserve his own holiness and justice. He must be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Christ. Romans 3.26. It's a de there is a definite and divine way by which sinners can be declared righteous. And apart from this way, such a thing cannot be possible. Um, it is, it's, you know, it's a kind of an interesting commentary on the sinful heart of mankind that deserving eternal condemnation, condemnation as he does and being offered so great a gift as justification of his life before God, he should complain of the divine method. There's only one way, God's way. Let us rejoice in God's way. Amen. Careful to note that the uh, details are given in the word of God. It's not by works. Number one, it is not by works. There's one truth made clear in the New Testament. It is no man is justified on the basis of his own righteousness or his own good deeds. Abraham were justified by works. He hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 4, 2 through 5. Even so, then, at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Roman, I just want you to love Paul. He gets a little... Whatever sometimes. Romans 11, 5. In other words, you can't earn it. So number one, the method of justification is that it's not by works. It is not by endeavoring to keep the law. I remember growing up, you know, um, we would um, we'd go home after church. Now we would we got to a point where we would leave early and go to uh, Parker's Barbecue. We'd leave after Sunday school. We'd slip out between Sunday school and church when after we saw Grandmama. And go get in line first so we could get into Parker's early. And because um, we were going to go in there and get family style. So we do Sunday school. Now, that's what my family did. Hallelujah. And we go to Parker's. And um, 
and then we go home. Well, church would visit on Sundays, or sometimes grandma would come. You'd be out in the yard washing your car, vacuuming your car, and you know we were we were Pentecostal, so you can't work on Sunday. Well, because grandma won't watch. I, like if it was really a sin, God was watching. Sheesh. But you get a phone call. We didn't have cell phones back in the You didn't get a cell phone. Hey, I'm right around the corner. You got a phone call from somebody at the church. They were on their way. They were leaving Greenwood to head to Aden. And uh, Brother Moore would come over sometime. Young ass, get, out, get everything put away. The, the people from the church are coming over. Our grand, granny's coming over. You're running around. My car's half washed. You know? Uh, well, you got to get it all put away and put up out like nothing was going on. Be in there resting because it's the Sabbath. Yeah, because you got to keep the law on the Sabbath. We broke the law going to church. It was 10 miles. Well, 12 miles by the time we got to the church. We went, and, and then we went out and ate on Sunday. We double broke the law. Then got home and started washing the car. Triple broke the law. We would try vectors breakers. Hallelujah. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 19, 20, and 23. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, Galatians 2.16. Now, theoretically, it would be possible to be saved by keeping the law, if one could keep it perfectly. <laughs> there you go. Theoretically, you could be born, and if you never, ever, ever did anything wrong with any of the 3,000 demands in the law, you could have been justified. The word of God even tells us that if you break one part of it, you're guilty of the whole thing. Hallelujah. We've all utterly broken God's law in the past. We're unable to keep it perfectly in the future. Paul makes it quite clear that we're helpless in this, this regards. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, curses everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians 3.10. It is not that there's anything wrong with the law. Paul says the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good in Romans 7, 12. The trouble is that with those that cannot keep it, the law serves to make men realize they are sinners. By the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3, 20. The law is like an alarm clock, which has the ability to awaken one, but it does not have the power to get him out of bed. Oh, dear Lord, don't you wish you had one of them? Probably not. Some of y'all would get ejected right out of the bed and to the floor. Bing! It is like the, the flight schedule of an airliner, which tells you the time the, place, the plane leaves, but cannot guarantee that you will be at the airport on time. Romans 8.3 says that the law is weak through the flesh. It is sad to see people trying to depend on their own good works or sacrifices in the hope of finding forgiveness of sin with God. Um, a missionary observed a little mother in India approaching the Holy River um, with a weak, he may see a child in her arms with a strong, healthy boy around along her side. Sometime he, uh, later, he, re, he uh, observed her returning from the place of sacrifice with only the weakling in her arms. Mother, I went to India, he asked. Where is the healthy, beautiful child who was by your side? She, re she replied, when we sacrifice to our God, we always give our best. Wow. Sacrificed her, a child to appease their God. Don't have any misunderstanding about the teachings of Paul and James. The contradiction that is imagined um, is not so. There is no con conflict between James and Paul. Therefore, we conclude, says Paul, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, Romans 3.28. You see then, says James, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only, James 2.24. There's no contradiction. They're both being inspired by the same Holy Ghost. They are writing about two different aspects of one subject. Paul is telling us that salvation by faith alone and not by works 
Oh, while James is insisting that a faith that is genuine will result in good works. We like to call it this. James is making reference to corresponding action. Actions that correspond with the faith that you have. Not actions that produce the result of salvation. <coughs> so, so Paul's talking about there is no actions that can produce the result of salvation. James is talking about actions that are reproduced by the result of salvation. Two different things. But those who are unlearned, grab that and run off with it. Okay? So Paul's is works don't produce salvation. James is saying if you got saved, there's going to be some works. Okay? <coughs> the works follow the salvation. They don't produce it. <coughs> and cannot produce it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There you go. See, that's works following it. Of which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You should walk in good works as a result of the righteousness and justification that you have received. Hallelujah. Thus the faith that saves without works will result in good works. Faith cannot be seen. It can only be judged by what a man does. That is why James says, show me the faith without thy works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. In James 2.18. Abraham's faith, it was imputed to him for righteousness. In James 2.23, it was manifest by faith. And when he offered Isaac, his son was upon the altar. The... <coughs> <coughs> the outward act clearly demonstrating the inner, the inner faith. Glory to God. Next, by the, by the gift of God's grace. Justification cannot be worked for, neither merited. It is only received through God's grace. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24 being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus 3.17. So what is grace? Now the word grace is, a, is a, the Greek charis. And we get the word charismatic from that. Uh, it originally meant beauty or beautiful conduct. Later though, uh, it was used to mean any favor granted to another, especially when the recipient had not merited such a favor. The Bible writers um, borrowed this term. And, and under God's guidance, clothe it with a new significance so that in the New Testament, it is usually meant the forgiveness of sins granted entirely out of the goodness of God, completely apart from any merit on the part of the person forgiven. Okay? It's not just God's favor. Grace is not just God's favor. Many words in the Greek language when brought into New Testament uh, writings were elevated or morphed into a deeper meaning and brought into a theological perspective and meaning. Um, and Jesus did that with the word agape uh, and moved it from, you know, a, a Roman word for love to God's love, you know, unconditional love. Um, it took on a higher meaning. Grace did too. So let's look at this again. It means close, um, the forgiveness of sins granted entirely out of the goodness of God, completely apart from any merit on the part of the person forgiven. So God blesses the man in the face of all non-merit, hallelujah, and positive dismerit. You know, whether he, he, he had no merit and any merit that he tried to do, he was forgiven in the face of all that. Someone said this, that, to feed a tramp who calls on me is unmerited favor, but scarcely grace. To feed a tramp who has robbed me would be grace. Grace is favor shown where there is positive demerit. You don't deserve it. You absolutely don't deserve it. Grace is not merely something which God expresses. It is an expression of what he is. Grace is the attitude on God's part that proceeds entirely from within himself and is conditioned in no way by anything in the objects of his favor. Uh, Henry Mabel was quoted as saying, Grace is a boon purchased for us by the court which found us guilty. Fitzwater's definition of grace is, as applied to salvation, grace means that what the holy and righteous God demands of us, 
was provided by himself. God in his grace is not dealing with innocent creatures, but with sinners under righteous and just condemnation. In grace, what God's righteousness demands, he supplies. A.W. Pink wrote and said, Grace is a provision for men who are so fallen that they cannot help themselves, so corrupt they cannot change their natures, so adverse to God they cannot turn to him, so blind they cannot see him, and so deaf they cannot hear him, so dead that he himself must open their graves and lift them into resurrection. <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> what do y'all think? Glory to God. Praise God. Through the substitution, or next is through the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ. God cannot forgive our sins just because he's gracious. As a, as a God of justice, he cannot merely overlook sin. His pardon is based upon the strict terms of justice. The penalty of our sins has been paid. Paid by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The sins of the believer are put to the account of Christ. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, shall live unto righteousness. 1 Peter 2.24 For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God can forgive sin because the law has been kept and the penalty for its breaking has been paid. <clears throat> Not only in the penalty of our sin paid by Christ, but, in, but in his perfect obedience to the law, provided the righteousness which God could put to our account. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so that by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans 5, 19. Thus, we have the amazing situation whereby Christ takes our sin upon himself while his righteousness is bestowed upon us. What an exchange. Hallelujah. That's exactly what God did to all who believe. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And we're going to go through this last part right here. And then we'll, we'll conclude for the night. It is through faith alone. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation for through his faith in his blood, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. Romans 3, 24 and 26. But to him that worketh not, he but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, or counted for righteousness. Romans 4, 4 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, <clears throat> we have peace with God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, Romans 10, 10. Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith in Jesus and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. When we declare that we are justified through faith, We must realize that faith is not something that we meritoriously offer to God for our salvation. It is the means through which we receive his gracious provision. We can say of faith, as we said of repentance, quoting Theism, we are not saved for our faith, but through our faith. We must bear in mind two more facts. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee of our justification. Romans 4.25 says, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. The fact that God raised Jesus from the dead is a testimony that he was satisfied with the sacrifice Jesus made. And that our sins, which he took upon himself, are gone. It is the Father's seal of approval upon Christ's redemptive work. Secondly, justification is complete. There are no degrees in justification. The babe in Jesus Christ stands in the same justification as the believer of 50 years. There is no such thing as progression to justification. When you get born again, you get born again. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I sure hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, that was good stuff. And we covered a lot of material, but you can go back and watch it again. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll go ahead and receive our offering for tonight. Um, if you need to give your, your, your um, electronic means of PayPal or Cash App, you can go ahead and get that ready. Don't forget to share our building fund campaign. 
um, from the GoFundMe page out there. We need to keep that going. Let's go with this kind of wrap this year up and go into the new year looking forward to getting into our own building. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Got your offerings ready. Go ahead and get ready to send them. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the tithe. Thank you for the offering. Thank you that people are blessed with your, your holy word. And thank you that your word decrees that you open heaven's window and empty out them blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God and praise God. Well, thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us tonight. So glad to have you tonight and uh, to cover this important subject and as we're covering this teaching on soteriology, the study of salvation, <coughs> we trust it's been beneficial to you. Praise God. Next week, we get into um, regeneration. Hallelujah. We go from justification to regeneration. It's going to be good stuff. Hallelujah. Well, look, we love you. God bless you. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church. God bless you.